Hello everyone, I am Genevieve Bibelkase and welcome to Lesson 6 in Life and Work of Rizal. Now we will discuss how and why did Rizal was exiled in the Pitan. But first of all, let's have our very short activity. They say not all heroes wear capes. A hero is selfless and genuinely good person. Now I want you to share with everyone today what does it take to be a hero. I will give you three minutes to comment down below your answers of the true qualities of a hero. Okay, three minutes is up and now let's proceed to our proper discussion. Results Exile in the Pitan Rizal lived in exile in far away Dapitan, a remote town in Mindanao, which was under the missionary jurisdiction of the Jesuits from 1892 to 1896. This four-year interregnum in his life was tediously and exciting but was abundantly fruitful with varied achievements. He practiced medicine, pursued scientific studies, continued his artistic and literary works, widened his knowledge of languages, established a school for boys, promoted community development projects, invented a wooden machine for making bricks, and engaged in farming and commerce. Despite his multifarious activities, he kept an extensive correspondence with his family, relatives, a fellow reformist, scientists, and scholars of Europe, including Blumentritt, Reinhold Roast, and A.B. Mayer, and many more. A busy life in exile. The authorities did not demand total control over Rizal's activities while he was in exile. Although his political rights were denied him, he was essentially free to do what he pleased to undertake in the place of his exile in the Pitan. Rizal had to be in good political behavior by reporting to his military supervisor regularly. Otherwise, he was on his own. In general, Rizal developed a congenial relationship with the symbol of his political impotence, the military commander to whom he reported. Essentially, this relationship grew out of respect and amiability as they went through their routinary meetings. A learned and inquis inquisitive mind could not be kept in cold storage for long. Given the learning and superior knowledge that Jose Rizal earned in his studies and experience from his apprenticeships and his travels, there were always ways to put his knowledge to good use, to personally survive as well as to help the community in which he lived. They took many dimensions, but primarily he had to fend for himself. First, he thought of engaging in agricultural endeavors. He secured permission to plant fruit trees and coconuts on open land. A stroke of improbably good luck happened. Rizal had bought, along with his military commander and another local Spaniard, a lottery ticket in Manila that won the big second prize. That brought in for him a share of one-third from 20000 pesos price or 6,200 pesos. With proceeds from this pot, he was not able to buy 50 lanzones trees, 20 mango trees, macopa trees, some 50 lanka trees, santal trees, balones, 18 mangosteens, and planted some 1,400 coffee trees and 200 cacao seedlings. And several letters to Dr. Ferdinand Blumentritt, his Austrian friend and scholar correspondent, Jose Rizal described his life in the Pitan. Rizal wrote, I have a square house, a six-sided house, an eight-sided house, my mother, my sister Trinidad, a nephew who were then visiting, and I live in the square house. In the eight-sided house are my boys, pupils whom I am teaching, figuring Spanish and English. My chickens live in the six-sided house. I get up early at 5 o'clock, inspect my fields, feed the chickens, wake up my workers, and get them to work. At half past 7, we ate breakfast, then I examine and give treatment to my poor patients who come to see me, dress, and go to town. I return at noon and have my luncheon. Afterwards, I teach my boys until 4 o'clock and spend the rest of the afternoon in the fields. At night, I read and study. This is another letter. My life goes on peacefully and monotonously. 
To pass the time and help the local people her a little, I have turned merchant. I buy hemp and ship it to Manila. I was lucky this month. I made $200 at one blow. My present life is tranquil, peaceful, withdrawn, and without glory. But I think it is also useful. I am teaching some poor but intelligent children how to read Spanish and English, mathematics including geometry, and how to behave like men. A third letter. In six hours, I must read many letters and answer them. Load my hemp aboard ship. See the local commander, make inquiries, ask about money for my business, etc. The ship comes only once a month and stays here only eight hours, sometimes less. I have to open cases, inspect merchandise, visit my patients, give advice. Sometimes my head is all a whirl. I have turned half physician and half merchant. I have started a mercantile company here. I have taught the poor inhabitants of Mindanao to unite in order to do business so that they can make themselves independent and free themselves from the Chinese and thus be less exploited. Finally, another. Now we are going to make a reservoir on my lands. I have 14 boys whom I am teaching languages, mathematics and how to work since we have nothing to work on. I have decided to build a dike of stone, brick and cement so they may learn. Sal tried his artistic skills to make sketches of Philippine fish and other fauna and collected some specimens of this for German scholars in an effort to secure equipment and books for his use in the pita. This endeavor succeeded momentarily but was hampered by distance and supply logistics. Exile and imprisonment ended in execution. His Dapitan exile was to end in exchange for transfer as military doctor in Cuba. He was on board ship when the 1896 revolution outbreak took place and so was sent instead to Barcelona, Spain for imprisonment. Eventually, he was returned to Manila for trial and later execution in that year. That ends our discussions for Lesson 6. I hope that you have learned something meaningful today. Hello, I am Miss Daisy and welcome to the continuation of Lesson 6. Why don't we have a short activity before we start? I think that would be a good idea. Let's start. The words that will be formed from these pictures are the highlight of today's discussion. I will give you 30 seconds to guess the pictures. Let's start. Time's up. The word is trial. Were you able to guess it? I think so. Next. 30 seconds is over and the word is retraction. I bet you were also able to get that one. Number three. Time is up, it is execution. Easy, right? Let's go to the next pictures. Ding! The magic word is bagumbayan. Sounds familiar, isn't it? Now we're down to the last picture. Time's up, it is a year. It's 1896. Were you born in that year? Just kidding. So the words were trial, retraction, execution, bagong bayan, and 1896. And our discussion mainly revolved around these words. So after discussing results exile in the pitan, we'll now move to his trial and death. We are down to the last days of the national hero and how his death made an impact on the lives of Filipinos in the 19th century. So let's start with Rizal's trial. Rizal was arrested while on his way to Cuba. He then arrived on Manila on November 3, 1896, and this marks the start of his 56 days complete judicial process. His trial started on December 6, 1896. Though he pleaded his innocence, 
he was charged of rebellion, sedition, and conspiracy against the Spanish government in the Philippines. Rebellion or paghihimagsik is an act of violent or open resistance to an established government or ruler. Sedition is defined as a conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or monarch. And lastly, conspiracy or pakikipagsabwatan is a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. Interrogation began 12 days after with Colonel Francisco Olive, the judge advocate. He was informed of the charges against him but was not allowed to cross-examine the witnesses against him. This lasted for five consecutive days. Earlier on November 21, Rizal was asked if he knew the President of the Supreme Council of the Katipunan, Andres Bonifacio. The transcript of Rizal's trial shows his reply and that he does not know Bonifacio. He was further requested to explain the fact that, he, that his portrait is included in the Katipunan. Rizal then explained that the association might have secured the copy of his portrait. Rizal's name was used as a rallying cry, password, and as a means to solicit funds. He then clarified that he was not asking for alms. On November 26, 1896, Rizal was sworn in and the court records listed him as a native of Calamba, Laguna, of legal age, single, physician, never been tried before. Rizal was presented with a list of the suspected rebels, which Rizal knew some but not all of them. The proceedings of the interrogation were handed down to Governor Ramon Blanco and assigned Rafael Dominguez to file the charges. Nicolás Pena then suggested that Rizal be tried while on trial be kept behind bars without bail. His properties be attached to 1 million pesos and lastly, his defense counsel should be an army officer. His trial started on December 6, 1896. On the 20th of December 1896, Rizal, together with his counsel, traveled the Andrada of the Spanish artillery prepared for his defense. Dated December 26, 1896, the court martial assembled on Cuartal de España. The trial started with the readings of the accusations against Rizal. He was followed by the Andrada, Rizal's defense counsel. He read the brief of Rizal and Wenceslao Ritana described it as a reasoned and in spite of its simplicity, a brilliant defense. However, the decision was already submitted for decision without questions coming from the court martial. Now, let's go to the retraction. It has always been a controversy if Rizal retracted all of his writings and words against the Catholic Church. The retraction letter dated December 29, 1896 has said to be signed by Jose Rizal himself. The issue whether Rizal wrote a retraction document or not lies on the judgment of the readers, as no enough evidence can make the two opposing groups agree with each other. Supporters said that there were four well-known reasons why Rizal wrote the retraction document. First, he wanted to marry Josephine Bracken to make her his wife legally. Second, he wanted to protect his family. Third, he wanted reforms from Spanish government. And lastly, he wanted to heal the sickness of the Catholic Church. There were accounts saying that the first draft of the retraction was sent to Rizal in Fort Santiago by Archbishop Bernardo Nozaleda, but Rizal rejected it because it was lengthy. Father Vicente Balaguer said that Rizal accepted instead a shorter version prepared by Father P.U.P., the superior of the Jesuit society in the Philippines. He then wrote his attraction and made some modification on the document. The document only surfaced the public on May 30, 1935. It was found by Father Manuel A. Gracia at the Catholic Hierarchies Archive in Manila. The original document was never shown only reproductions of it. On the other hand, 
Father PUP stated that as early as 1907, the retraction was copied verbatim and published in Spain and reprinted it in Manila. Father Gracia, who found the original document, also copied it verbatim. In both reproductions, there were conflicting versions of the text. So, which is which? It still remains a controversy up until this day. Ocong of 2012, in his article written under the Historical Commission of the Philippines, said that we must put the question of retraction to rest. Though Rizal is a hero, whether he retracted or not, we must investigate if he really did a turn around. If he did not, and the documents were forgeries, then somebody has to pay for trying to deceive a nation. Now we move on to the Rizal's death. Rizal died on December 30, 1896, and this should not be confused with his birthday. At 6 a.m. of December 29, 1896, Captain Rafael Dominguez read Rizal's death sentence and declared that he will be shot on December 30 at 7 in the morning the next day in Bagumbayan. On the evening of December 29, Rizal had his last supper and informed Captain Dominguez that he had forgiven his enemies, including the military judges that condemned him to die. On Rizal's way from Fort Santiago to Bagumbayan, he was guarded and with him are Jesuits. His arms were tied behind him and as he walks, he remanished his childhood and his days at Ateneo. In Bagumbayan, the Spanish troops held the crowd back while the artillery group were on alert just in case there would be an attempt to res rescue Rizal. The firing squad was composed of Filipinos and behind them were Spanish soldiers who will make certain of Rizal's death in the event that Filipino soldiers might break their duty. Additionally, after Rizal's death, his body was brought to San Juan de Dios Hospital and were later on buried in the Paco Cemetery in an unmarked grave. Rizal's sister, Narcesa, looked on suburban graveyards for where Jose Rizal was buried. She eventually discovered that he was buried in the Paco Park. She marked the plot with the letters RPJ, Rizal's initials in reverse. The remains of Rizal, after exhumation on August 17, 1898, were kept in the Rizal family house in Binondo until they were brought to their final resting place in Luneta. On December 30, 1912, a solemn ceremony was held to finally bury the remains in the base of the monument dedicated in memory of Rizal. So that's the end of our module 2. I hope you've learned something. See you in our next video on module 3.